So we're going to go to the Word of God now. Thank you. This is a message entitled Progressions. Last week we talked about transitions, and the week before that we talked about disillusionment. So two Sundays ago I spoke about disillusioned Christians, and uh, the reason that Christians get disillusioned, the reason they get that way is because they are misinformed, I believe, about what following Jesus is all about. Disillusioned Christians focus on receiving and being blessed, but in a particular way, they somehow think that the Lord is obligated to give them every desire of their heart, but without examining their heart to see if their motives are right. They are Christians who seek to be served and catered to rather than serving and laying down their lives for others. So they expect to receive all the time, not only from the Lord, but from the pastor and from the body of Christ. In my opinion, theirs is a twisted form of faith that somehow has missed out on the fact that Jesus saves you to pour out living water, not to suck in. Pour out, not to suck in. And when things don't go exactly as they expect, disillusioned Christians sour on God, they turn on the body of Christ, and they drop out either literally or in their hearts, and they become very bitter, very, very bitter. Their understanding of God is that he lives for their benefit and that his promises, his talents, and his, his gifts are for their own aggrandizement. Now, aggrandizement means any act that increases one's wealth, riches, status, influence, comfort, luxuries, and blessings as an end in itself. This is what disillusions believe God exists for. And so in exchange for minimal faith, I believe in you, Jesus. I showed up in church on Sunday. In exchange for minimal faith, they expect some sort of great earthly reward. Now, there are two examples of this, but I'll give you one. Jacob, when he was run out of the house by his brother Esau, from whom he stole both the blessing and inheritance from his father Isaac, was alone and isolated in the wilderness on his way to his uncle Laban's house. And there he received a vision of the ladder ascending into heaven to the throne of God, with angels and archangels ascending and descending on this particular ladder. And it was there in that spot. I'm going to back up a little bit because I'm getting feedback from the speakers. So just give me a minute to adjust. There we are. I'm still getting feedback. Just turn down my channel. See where, see where the green... Uh, just turn down my channel. You see it? Number 14 or 15, I think. Just turn it down. It'll be all right. There we are. Perfect. That's it. No. All right. I'm not used to using this microphone. When Jacob was in the wilderness, he struck a deal with the Lord. And this was the deal. It's described in Genesis 28, verses 16 to 22. Then Jacob awoke from his sleep, and he said, Surely the Lord is in this place, and I wasn't even aware of it. But he was also afraid, and he said, What an awesome place this is. It's none other than the house of God, the very gateway to heaven. And the next morning Jacob got up very early, and he took the stone that had rested on his head and set it upright as a memorial pillar. Then he poured olive oil over it, and he named the place Bethel, which means the house of God, although it was previously called Luz. Then Jacob made this vow. Listen to this vow. If God indeed will be with me and protect me on this journey, and if he will provide me with food and clothing, and if I return safely to my father's house, then the Lord will certainly be my God, and this memorial pillar I have set up and will become a place for worshiping God, and I will present to God a tenth of everything he gives me. In other words, I will serve you, Lord, as long as you give me what I want. After all, isn't that what believing in you is all about? Receiving what I want and the desires of my heart? Well, Jacob soon found out that no, this is not the reason why we serve God. And the angel of the Lord came and wrestled with him all night after he was forced to get rid of his money, to get rid of his assets, to get rid of his family, his children, and he was left alone with nothing. And the angel of the Lord, who I believe was pre-incarnate Jesus, wrestled with him all night, and while they wrestled, there was a change of heart, 
And Jacob found out or discovered that following the Lord is not about receiving what you want, but it's about turning from the darkness of your old sin nature and being transformed in your heart to the point where the Lord becomes your greatest treasure, your closest friend, and the greatest passion of your life. So much so that everything else in your life, while important, pales into insignificance in the light of the Lord Jesus Christ. So that even your affection and love for your husband, your wife, your children, your best friends, while strong, is nothing compared to your love for the Lord Jesus Christ. The disillusioned Christians never rise to this point because their faith is all about them and what they can extract from God. It's not about a change of heart. It's not about a refocus from themselves onto the Lord. It's not about spiritual rebirth that is evidenced by an overwhelming passion for Jesus. It's not about any of those things. It's about gimme, gimme, gimme. And if you don't gimme, then you're not much of a God. And your church is not much of a church. You know, during my travels as an evangelist, I traveled for about 28 years, one of the pastors that I really admired, I met in Cleveland, Ohio, and his name was Mike Marino, wonderful man of God. I'm not even sure if he's still with us today. It was quite a long time ago. But he used to ask his congregation members two questions. The first question he would ask was, do you know Jesus? And almost everybody in his church would say with confidence, yes, I know Jesus. And then he would ask, great, but do you love Jesus? And almost everybody would squirm when he asked that question. Do you know Jesus? Yes, great. Do you love Jesus? Um, yeah. Now many Christians know Jesus. They know the salvation message. They've had a lot of information about him stored up here, and maybe even in here too. These Christians could pass a written test on Jesus' life, ministry, and teachings. And some of them would even claim that they know Jesus personally and have an intimate relationship with him as far as their understanding of what a relationship with God is. But only a handful, listen to this, only a handful of Christians can sincerely answer the question, yes, I love Jesus. Almost as if the Holy Spirit will not allow them to make that confession because if they did, they would be lying. Because to really know Jesus is to love him. To love him with all your heart, soul, strength, and mind. And it doesn't just stop there, but it's also to love the things that he loves. You love Jesus? That's great. Demonstrated by loving the things that he loves. Because loving Jesus with all your heart, soul, strength, and mind is to be amazed by him to love his presence, to have a burning desire to please him. And I suppose that's why Jesus measured love for him, not by your feelings. No, feelings are deceiving. Jesus didn't measure your love for him by a veneer of religion, going to church and trying to be a good person and going through the spiritual disciplines of reading the word and praying and all of that. That essentially on its own does not impress him. Not only is it deceptive and ineffective, but it's detestable to Jesus if you think that going to church and trying to be a good person and exercising the spiritual dis uh, disciplines demonstrate your love for him. Not even close. And he would say to you, here's how you show you that you love me. Love the things that I love. Love the Father. Love his word. Love your brothers and sisters and connect with them regularly and meaningfully. Not just casually in the church lobby shaking hands, but beyond that. Love the members of the body of Christ and bring them into your life and serve them as I would serve them if, you were, if I was in your place. Love my leaders and my under shepherds and treat them with dignity and respect and obedience as you would treat me. Love the house of God as I love the house of God and make the house of God your second home. Make the gathering place of believers the most important institution of your life, greater than your home, greater than your school, 
greater than your place of business, greater than any place else. You want to demonstrate your love for me, Jesus would say? Love my presence. Love worship and praise. Love serving my people. Love holiness and righteousness. Hate sin and love the lost. And that's how you demonstrate your love for Jesus. Now I can back up every one of these criteria with scripture. But I will summarize them all by quoting you just one scripture. Jesus said, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments. If you love me, you'll keep my commandments. Even if you are hurt, even if you are rejected, persecuted and forsaken, even if things don't go your way, even if you don't like the situation that you are in, even if you are at the gates of hell itself, obey and keep my commandments, and by that you demonstrate that you love me. Be like me. Be quick to forgive. Be patient. Be gentle. Be tender-hearted towards each other. Love one another as I have loved you. Do you know him? Do you really know him? You would say, yes, I know him. Let me ask you then, based on what I've described up to now, do you love him? Do you love him? Do you love him? Never mind how you feel about him. It doesn't matter how you feel about Jesus. Some have no feelings for Jesus at all. Some people are mushy and gushy about Jesus. And to some people, loving Jesus doesn't mean anything to them. It's a concept they're not, they're not familiar with. But the question is, does your life demonstrate a love for Jesus as he describes in his word? The disillusioned, for the most part, either have no idea of any of this, or they lost sight of it long ago when God didn't live up to their self-centered expectations. But now I must confess something, which is very important. No one can love Jesus the way he prescribes. No one. I I need to repeat that. No one can love Jesus the way he prescribes. Anyone could be religious. Anyone can do the spiritual disciplines. Anybody can show up to church and try to be a good person. Anybody can do that. But no one can attain the passion that warms the heart of God and gets his attention. Nobody. There is only one who can. One who can, only one who loves Jesus to that degree, who although he is God, co-equal and co-substantial with the Father, and blushes at the idea of drawing attention to himself, but would rather honor the Father by glorifying the Son, the one that loves Jesus the way I prescribe, and the only one that can love him that way is the Holy Spirit of God. He knows exactly how to love Jesus and love the things that Jesus loves. And you need him to be inside of you, working and yielding to him fully if you're, in, if you're going to love Jesus the way he prescribes. Philippians 2.13 says that God is at work in you, both to will and to do according to his good pleasure. That's the Holy Spirit that Paul is talking about. So when the Holy Spirit is truly in your life, and he is truly working in your life, and you are yielding and responding to him, do you know what will happen to you? You will love Jesus and the things that Jesus loves. The Spirit of God will inspire you, motivate you, empower you, and release you to love the Father, to love his word, to love your brothers and sisters and connect with them regularly and meaningfully, not just in the church lobby shaking hands, but beyond that. The Holy Spirit will inspire you to bring the members of the body of Christ into your life and serve them as Jesus would if he were in your place. The Spirit of God will compel you to love his leaders, his under shepherds, and treat them with dignity, respect, and obedience as you would Jesus if he appeared to you physically. The Spirit of God will give you a love for the house of God and for the people of God as Jesus loves the house of God. The Holy Spirit will inspire you to make the house of God, yes, this house, your second home, and to make the gathering of believers in this place 
the most important time, the most important institution of your life, greater than your own home, greater than your school, greater than your place of business, greater than any place else, the Holy Spirit will teach you and will move you into loving the presence of God, loving worship and praise, loving serving Him and His people, loving holiness and righteousness, hating sin, and finally loving the lost. You will love Jesus and love being like Jesus, and that's how you know that the Spirit of God is moving in your life. And that's why Jesus himself says in John 16, 13 to 15, however, when he, the Spirit of truth, has come, he will guide you into all truth. For he will not speak on his own authority. I told you, the Holy Spirit blushes at the thought of drawing attention to himself, even though he's so powerful in manifestation. But whatever he hears, he will speak. And he will tell you the things to come. Here is the Spirit of God's ministry in you. He will glorify me. He will take of what is mine and he will give it to you. All things that the Father has are mine. Therefore I will take, I said that the Spirit of God will take of mine and he will declare it to you. In other words, he will implant it in you and you will love Jesus and love the things that Jesus loves. That's how you know you're walking in the Spirit. The Spirit changes you from the moment you commit your life to Jesus. And he's responsible for what we talked about last week, transitions. To take you from where you are and from what you are and to lead you into what Jesus wants you to be and where he wants you to be. That's the spirit of God's prime directive. We talked about the great transition of the Christian life described in 2 Corinthians 5, 17. If anyone be in Christ, he's a new creature, all the old things are passed away, and behold, everything becomes brand new. But Romans 6 is more specific of, about what this trans transition involves. So here's Romans 6, verses 4, all the way down to verse 13. Here's the specific aspects of the great transition from being lost to being born again. For we died, Romans chapter 6, verse 4 says, and we were buried with Christ by baptism. But just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glorious power of the Father, now we also may live new lives. Detail number one. Since we have been united with him in his death, we will also be raised to life as he was. We know that our old sinful self was crucified with Christ so that sin might lose its power in our lives. We are no longer slaves to sin. Detail number two. For when we died with Christ, we were set free from the power of sin. Detail number three. And since we died with Christ, we know we shall also live with him. Detail number four. We are sure of this. Because Christ was raised from the dead, he will never die again. Death no longer has any power over him. And when he died, he died once to break the power of sin. But now that he lives, he lives for the glory of God. So now you should also consider yourselves to be dead to the power of sin and alive to God through Jesus Christ. Detail number six. Do not let sin control the way that you live. Oh, I need to say that again. Do not let sin control the way that you live. Do not, let any, uh, do not give in to your sinful desires. Do not let any part of your body become an instrument of evil to serve sin. Instead, give yourselves completely to God for you are dead, but now you have new life. So use your whole body as an instrument to do what is right for the glory of God. Oh, I need a major transition for that to happen. It happened when you were born again by the Spirit of God. If indeed you were born again by the Spirit of God, perhaps you were not born again, and that's why you can't do what I've just read. Oh, it's a tough business to evaluate yourself according to the Word of God, but it's essential. And it's never negative. You, you, you may fall short in certain areas and discover you don't have what the Word of God is talking about. It's not a negative thing. Because just for the asking, you can make things all right again in Jesus Christ. Just for the asking. We discovered that there are many transitions in the Christian life, but they all have the same goal. And I repeat, it's to take you from what you are now and where you are now and lead you to where God wants you to be and what God wants you to be.
Isn't it wonderful that the Word of God tells you exactly the general stages of transition that you will go through? Now, if you didn't know that, you're going to know that today. The Word of God describes the general transitions that you will go through throughout the Christian life. And it's in Romans 8, verses 27 to 30. Now, he who searches the hearts knows what the mind of the Spirit is because he makes intercession for the saints according to the will of God. And we know that all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. Can I mention that that's a conditional promise? Because if you don't love Jesus, you don't love God, and you're just religion, uh, religious, don't expect all things to work together for good. All things work together for good to those who love God and are called and have responded to that call according to his purpose. For whom he foreknew, he also predestined to become conformed to the image of his Son. Here's the, here's the transitions. That he might be the firstborn amongst many brethren. Whom he predestined, these he also called. Whom he called, these he also justified. And whom he justified, these he also glorified. All of those are the general transitions of your Christian life and mine. We're all going to go through this. What does it mean? It means that God had his eye on you long before you were saved and committed your life to him. And at the opportune time, he revealed himself to you. He predetermined before the foundation of the world to reveal himself to you and call you into his kingdom. You remember the day that you were called? I remember the day to the detail. November the 4th, 1974 at Onward Gospel Church in Verdun on the corner of Galt and Wellington Street right in my hometown. I remember the precise time. I remember the precise moment he revealed himself to me and called me into his kingdom. And I responded. Thank God I responded. When he reveals himself to you and calls you, then he justifies you. He makes you aware of the blood of the cross and the sacrifice of Jesus and what he did for you there. He makes you aware that all your personal sins are forgiven. The penalty for your sins is erased. The power of sin, specific sin, the things that you are always tripped up with, the things that you always give in with, with, into, the dark side of your personality, the part of you that stinks, he gave you power over that through the blood of the cross. You, you were your own worst enemy. And he changed all that. <laughs> now you're a friend of God. He justified you. Sin was crushed. He washed your sins away. And he continued to wash away any aspect or any manifestation of your old sin nature. No matter how often it comes up. I was not perfected the day I was saved. Wait a minute, wait a minute. I was not perfected on the day I was saved. Because no one is perfected on the day that they are saved. But I was justified on the day that I was saved because the Father looks at me now just as if I have never sinned, regardless of the fact that sometimes my sin nature may come up. Now when it does, what does Jesus want me to do? Well, since he died on the cross and his blood covers sins past, present, and future, I have a reservoir of forgiveness so that when I fall, if I confess my sins, he is faithful and just to forgive me of my sins and to cleanse me from all unrighteousness. So if some dirty, filthy thing carries over from the old life after I give my life to Jesus and it becomes a thorn in my flesh, the blood of Jesus and what he did on the cross, his presence in me will overcome it and I'll never sin that way again. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Then after taking care of the sin issue in your life, he begins to glorify himself through you by making you more like Jesus from day to day. And here's the, here's the secret. As you become more like Jesus every day, that's when he leads you into your destiny. He will never lead anybody into their destiny who is not like his son. Why would he? So that you can exercise and manifest your corrupt personality and the destiny that God gives you? That doesn't make any sense. He wants you to be like Jesus. And when you are more and more like Jesus, you have more and more discovered what it is that he wants you to do in this life. It's a progression. No question about it, and I'll get to that later. 
So day by day, you become more like Jesus. He leads you into your destiny according to your God-given gifts, talents, and opportunity. But more importantly, he gives you the heart to trust his plan for your life and follow him every step of the way. Don't sit there and question, God, why did you do this in my life? Why did you bring this thing in my life? Why am I in the situation that I'm in now? I can answer the question for you. You may not like the situation that you're in now, but it has been orchestrated by the hand of God to stretch you to the limit if necessary so that you can become like Jesus. You may not be like Jesus now in the midst of this very uncomfortable, un uh, annoying situation, but you will be if you yield to the Spirit and hear what his voice would tell you about how to deal with it. But some transitions are hard, we discovered. Some are easy, but ultimately, as long as you obediently yield to the Spirit, God will have his way. And in may many cases, he has his way anyway. Because guess what? When you committed your life to the Lord Jesus Christ, you signed into an everlasting covenant. And if you run, he'll hunt you down. He'll come after you. He'll find you. He'll pull you out of the pit. He will confront you. You can't run away from the convicting power of the Holy Spirit. He will find you and he will woo you to come back. And if you resist and run for a long time, the conviction will mount and it will become unbearable. Now at last we come to the portion of the Christian life that I want to discuss today. And it won't take long. And that is that the Christian life is a life of progression. If you're a true follower of Jesus and not merely a self-deceived pretender, you will notice growth and progress continually in your life until the day that you die. And the definition of progression is any movement or development towards a destination, a more advanced state, or gradually in stages, becoming better than you are. And the scripture is full of verses that speak to this progression that I'm talking about this morning. 2 Corinthians 3.18 But we all with an unveiled face behold as in a mirror the glory of the Lord. Listen, we are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory. From glory to glory. From glory to glory just as by the Spirit of God. Progression. Growth, advancement, maturity. Isaiah 28, 9 and 10. Whom will he teach knowledge to? Whom will he make to understand the message? Those who are just weaned from milk? Those that, are, that have just drawn from the breasts? For growth in the Lord, I've added that, is precept upon precept, line upon line, here a little, there a little. Progression progression in the Christian life. Ephesians 4.15, but speaking the truth in love, we are to grow in all aspects unto him who is the head, even Christ. Progression, progression in various aspects of life. Job 17.9, nevertheless the righteous will hold to his way, and he who has a clean, clean hands will grow stronger and stronger. Well, that's a good one. He who has clean hands will grow stronger and stronger. Hey, if you've got sin in your life, you're going to stagnate. You're going to go backwards. You're not going to advance. And the Spirit of God is in your life to advance you and conform you to the image of Christ. Sin will stop you dead. Psalm 84, 5. How blessed is the man whose strength is you, O Lord, in whose heart are the highways to Zion. Psalm 92, 12. The righteous man will flourish like a palm tree. He will grow like a cedar in Lebanon. And Proverbs 4.18, but the path of the righteous is like the, li the light of dawn. Listen to this. The light of dawn that shines brighter and brighter and brighter until it becomes a full day. Amazing. So just like transitions, progressions can be quick, easy, immediate, or slow, painful, agonizing, and challenging you to the limit. But you'll know you're walking in the Spirit when you see that you are moving forward in Jesus. You keep moving forward. Come triumph and tragedy, you keep moving forward. Come blessing or adversity, you keep 
moving forward. Come seasons of abundance and seasons of need, you keep moving forward. Come sorrow or come joy, you keep moving forward. Come honor or disgrace, you keep moving forward. No matter what may come, you keep moving forward. Because there are two things that are absolutely unacceptable to the Spirit of God. One, sliding backwards into the old ways, the old attitudes, and the old nature. That's unacceptable in the kingdom of God. And second, stagnation. Not moving forward at all. Very little or no growth in the Lord Jesus Christ. See, you should be able to look back a year ago and see a major difference in your life, in who you are, in the form of transition and progress. You shouldn't be today what you were a year ago. You should not be the same person. In fact, you should be amazed at what God has done in your life in just 365 days. Now, I wonder sometimes where some of you have been. We had a pastor's meeting last week, Wednesday, with uh, some of the pastors of the city. And we discussed our concerns about our people. We, we do that every month. We get together, we pray, we support each other. Well, I can tell you my concern. Some of you are no different today than you were a year ago. No more consecrated, no more committed, no more empowered, no more invested in the things of God, no more vibrant and no more passionate than you were a year ago. And some of you are still dealing with the same issues you did 365 days ago. There has been no transition and no progress in your life. And some, some of you, a small handful of you, for whatever reason, have regressed. You've gone backwards into vile, ungodly behavior not fitting for followers of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now that's contrary to what the Spirit of God wants to work in your life. So how can we measure ourselves against the will of God? What do we do about it? Well, here's how you measure yourself. Do you love Jesus more this year than you did last year? Do you love the things that he loves more than you did 365 days ago? Do you love his word more today than you did yesterday? Do you love your brothers and sisters more? Connect with them more? Has your love and respect for God's leaders and under shepherds increased? Do you treat them with more dignity, respect, and obedience than you did in the past? Has your love for the house of God grown in the last 12 months or are you still a Sunday morning Christian? Have you learned to love the presence of God and grow in your love of worship and praise? Have you progressed in your love of serving him and his people? Are you more in involved in the house of God today than you were 12 months ago? Has holiness and righteousness grown, grown larger in your life or has it become diminished? What about how you feel about sin? And I mean your own sin. And what about your love for the lost? Do you have a greater passion for souls today than you did 52 weeks ago. Because if you've grown at all, if there has been any kind of transition in your life at all, if there's been any progress in your life at all, you will see an advance in one or more of these areas. You will love Jesus and you will love being like him. Now this is not meant to condemn you, embarrass you or make you feel like a failure. I'm well aware of what's happening in this church. All of us are being elevated to a higher ground, all of us. Now, not everybody has cooperated or caught on yet, but I'm confident that they will. I'm even confident that the Friday night meeting will grow, and it'll grow so much other people will come and will fill this place all the way to the balcony and maybe even have to accommodate it in a different way. But people are hungry. People are thirsty for the reality of the Lord Jesus Christ. And if you look down deep into your spirit, if you shove away the complacency and the apathy, and you really 
close yourself in with Jesus just for a few moments and ask him to show you what his will is for your life, I guarantee you that a desire will begin to grow. You'll start to see yourself different than what you are now and you will desire to move out of what you are and where you are into what God wants you to be and where he wants you to be. But this list I've given you is just a tool to use to look at specific things in your life, what to look for, and make them your aim and purpose to know exactly what to shoot for. Now we do all that we can as a leadership to make it happen. But as a pastor, I just want to ask from you one thing, just one, and then we're gonna close. There is fellowship today, so I'm gonna have you stand and I have somebody come up and pray and dismiss and I'm gonna trust God as Leon and I have been discussing, that this word will stick in your spirit, that you will not be able to let it go, and that the spirit of God will woo you into applying it into your life. And I believe that he will, because it's God's hour here at the house. It's the hour of transformation, it's the hour of transition, and it's the hour of progress. And I can tell you this, I haven't sat down to evaluate how far we've come as a church since last year. I have seen some growth, but I can tell you this. Next year, we will be so much different than we are today. It'll boggle your mind because it's God's hour. It's God's hour. It's God's hour. If you believe that, just raise your hand and wave it. It's God's hour. And I'm so thankful to him. So here's what I ask of you as a pastor. I'm going to ask Joseph to go to the piano. Don't forget there's fellowship today right after. I ask you this one thing. Please look at me right in the eye. Don't be content with stagnation. Don't be content to just remain where you are, going through your preferred motions of the Christian life with no intent to grow, no intent to change. I'm just fine, Pastor, leave me alone. Don't be content with that. It's not from God. It's from the enemy. The enemy is the Lord of stagnation. And the Holy Spirit is the Lord of progress in Christ. Keep moving forward. Resolve in your heart and in your mind to keep moving forward into the transitions and the progressions that the Spirit of God will lead you, you, you into because progressions in the, spirit li in, the, in the Spirit are the fruit of the Christian life. And there are two very compelling scriptures that I'm going to close with. I'm not going to quote them or read them. I'm just going to refer to them. If there's any doubt that God wants you to grow and expects you to grow and yield to Him, and cooperate and move with him into those transitions and progressions. Remember the parable of the tree with no fruit. The owner of the orchard wanted to cut that tree down. But the gardener came and said, wait, wait a minute, no. Don't, don't cut it down yet. Let me dig a trench around it. Let me fertilize it. Let me work with it for a year. And see if it will produce fruit. And if it doesn't, well, then, then you can cut it down. For me, this is a picture of the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. There are a lot of unfruitful Christians in the body of Christ. A lot of Christians who think that they don't need to produce fruit. They have salvation, then that's plenty. Thank you very much. I don't need to do anything. I don't need to grow. I need to, 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 to advance. I can just be the, the same old vile, miserable, corrupt self and, and go to church and, and, and cover it over and that'll be fine. No, the Lord expects growth. Because the other portion of Scripture I wanted to refer to was the fig tree that Jesus went to examine to see if it had produced any fruit. And it hadn't. What did he do? He cursed it. And the next day it was withered. And if there's any doubt about that, you can read John chapter 15 where it says, I am the vine, you are the branches. Any branch in me that produces fruit, my Father prunes it so that it will produce fruit more fruit. Some transitions are hard. 
But if it doesn't produce fruit, it's cut off from the vine and thrown into the fire because it's just a useless branch. I don't know how that translates out. I'm not going to presume to interpret that. But just reading it is compelling enough for me. I have to tell you, I love Jesus and I don't want to displease him in any way. And I will do whatever is necessary to bring a smile to his face, to bring warmth to his heart, and to bring delight, to bring him delight when he looks down at my life. And so while you're sitting there, I'm once again going to ask Danny T to come. I've been using Danny a lot lately, but his heart is where my heart is, so that's why I'm asking him today to come and pray. That we will not, listen to me please, we will not settle for stagnation. Whatever you are now, ask the Lord to move you on, move you forward, move you deeper, because that's his will for your life. And I must say, speaking for myself, where he leads me, I will follow. Let's bow our heads. Thank <laughs> you.